Hello and welcome. I am Lian Bon and you are watching the live streamed recording of the Law of the Terta Land podcast. It's an interesting timing, but just a coincidence that as Bongbong Marcos announces today his presidential run for the 2022 elections, we are going to be talking about the ill-gotten wealth of his family led by his father, the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos. We are talking about billions and billions in cash, jewelries, paintings, real estate, bank certificates, and other instruments stashed in some banks or foundations elsewhere in the world. It's a very deep well of wealth, and we'll discuss if we've seen even close to the bottom of that well. And we will for that, we will talk to Filipino lawyer Ruben Carranza, who's based in New York as a senior expert of the International Center for Transitional Justice. He was a commissioner of the PCGG, which is tasked to run after uh, this Marcos ill-gotten wealth. Hello, Attorney Carranza. Thank you so much for giving us the time. Hi, hello, and I'm happy to be here. Okay, let's start off with uh, the baseline data. So PCGG nakarecover na siya ng 174 billion pesos and sabi nila they have 124 125 billion more to recover and it's under currently under litigation. So itong 174 plus 125, ito na ba ang extent ng Marcos ill-gotten wealth or is it possible na meron pa tayong hindi alam at meron pa tayong hindi uh, that, That's the both the challenge and the opportunity of going after the ill-gotten wealth of the Marcos family, we don't know exactly how much they stole. Uh, kaya hindi rin natin alam kung magkano pa yung dapat bawiin. Alam natin yung nabawi na because may mga decision na and contrary to all the propaganda that the Marcos family has been spewing out for so many years now, uh, there are cases that have not only recovered ill-gotten wealth from the Marcos family, but have definitively declared that the Marcos family is corrupt. So we don't know how much there is still left to recover. Uh, there was an estimate many years ago that the Marcos stole up to $5 billion from the Philippines, but we still have to find more, and I think there's more to be found. Uh, Attorney Caranza, are there assets na inaay yung PCGG dati pa pero hindi pa lang tayo, hindi pa lang nakakapag-file ng civil suit? So merong, merong, kang, merong inaay na hindi pa kasama sa baseline re record ng PCGG? Well, there are two ways to, to answer your question, Lian. Um, first, when the PCGG filed its cases beginning 1987 and then subsequently in the following years amended its complaints. The PCGG carefully crafted its complaint so that it will cover assets that were still to be found or assets where the evidence of their existence was still partial. So uh, whenever the commission, at least when I was there, uh, discovered some new evidence or some assets that previously was not documented, those assets, that evidence would actually already fall within an existing case. So that's the first answer. Yung pangalawang sagot sa tanong, marami pa bang hindi nakikita at dapat pang uh, sampahan ng kaso, uh, hindi na kailangan sampahan ng bagong civil case ang mga Marcos para mabawi kung ano man yung bagong mahanap. Uh, in 2003, the Philippine Supreme Court made a decision in case number GR152154, making it very clear that any assets that the Marcos spouses, Ferdinand and Imelda, claim to have that exceeds 304,000 US dollars is ill-gotten. So, linawin ko yan. Ang lihitimong kayamanan lang ng mga Marcos ay nasa halagang 304,000 US dollars. Kung meron pang halaga, ari-arian, pera, uh, alahas, paintings, fake na paintings na sinasabi nilang sa kanila, lahat yan. Subject to forfeitures, lahat yan 
dapat bawiin dahil ill-gotten wealth. So meron ng decision noong 2003, ilang beses na yung uh, naulit ng Philippine Supreme Court as late as 2012. Salamat sa pag-mention nung ano nung Sandigan Bayan versus uh, Republic versus Sandigan Bayan. Um yung dispositive portion kasi nung 2003 ruling na yan ay merong nakalagay na amount eh, 658 million US dollars. So uh, yung yung bang inexplain mo ni Karansa is Yes, merong um, 658 million dollars, but the Supreme Court also said, ano man ang lumagpas sa lawful income, which was 300,000 US dollars. Pwede pa rin kunan, that's my first question. My second question is, yung 658 million dollars ba, is it already in the possession of the government? So, let me answer the second question first, it quicker. Uh, So it's 685. Uh, I think the yung pagkabaliktad ng 5885 oh, comes from an comes from an error by the PCGG after I left the commission. Uh, I think there was a graphics card they made that they uh, I guess unintentionally put the number at 658 instead of 685. Okay. 685 because this started out as 360 when it was first found in 1986. Um, the PCGG found documents in Malacanang because the Marcos family fled hastily. And these documents pointed to several Swiss foundations. And I will later on change the, the term used for that. They're not really foundations the way we understand foundations, mm. at least in the Philippines or even in the U.S. Uh, and the amount at that time was something around 360. Uh, but because the litigation went on from 1987 all the way up to 2003, when the Philippine Supreme Court finally ruled, uh, like I said, uh, the amount went up to 685. Now, uh, is that amount in the hands of the Philippine government? Definitely. And a, a quick story about how literally the Philippine government uh, took that amount. Uh, there were discussions about how that amount would be transferred from Swiss Bank to the Philippines. Because even as the Philippine government already won that case in 2003, and I was still in the commission, the Marcoses did not stop in trying to block the return of that money. They sent a Swiss banker to Manila. That Swiss banker even tried to talk to a politically influential person no longer active in politics, and that person talked to someone who was in fact in the cabinet of one of the former presidents, not Marcos, but afterward, uh, to try to stop the transfer of the amount. The Marcos has tried to stop the transfer through Europe. Uh, there are clearing houses that facilitate the transfer of amounts of money across banks in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere in the world. They tried to go into that to stop the transfer. There was even talk about actually getting the money in cash on a plane, not by the Marcoses, but by the Philippine government, just so you could get the money out of Switzerland. So there were various means uh, discussed to transfer that money. Eventually, there was a decision, there was a particular process that was used, and the money was transferred to the Central Bank of the Philippines where it was fenced. In other words, it was set aside because at that time, I was already working on the first draft of what eventually, 10 years later, became the law providing reparations to victims of the Marcos dictatorship. So that's the answer to your first question. Uh, to the second question, I mean, the first question is, uh, does the 2003 decision not only refer to this amount? No, it doesn't. While the 2003 decision is about the 680 million that was being recovered from Switzerland, Um, and, and here I'll wear a, a lawyer's hat and <laughs> minsan ayokong magsuot nung... Uh, no, go ahead, sir. This is uh, the legal podcast, so I think the audience yeah. will be very appreciative of you wearing your legal hat. Right, because there's such a thing as stare decisis, you know, the, the law of the case. And the law of this case isn't really that the 680 million should be returned because it's forfeited because it's ill-gotten wealth. The law of the case in GR 152-154 is that the Marcoses 
only had 304,000 in legitimate income when he was president and when she was governor of Metro Manila. Everything else they claim, they own, that their children claim or that their children claim to be beneficiaries of is ill-gotten should be forfeited. So the law of the case in 2003 and up to now is that everything that the Marcoses own beyond the legitimate income that the government found is ill-gotten. So uh, what's important here is that you only needed this single judgment to go after everything that the Marcoses claim and that the PCGG was going and is going after its ill-gotten wealth. So, uh, so I'll add one last point here to stress the importance of the 2003 decision. One of the last acts I did as PCGG commissioner before I left was to draft a motion in the Sandigan Bayan to be filed in all possible cases where this motion could be filed. I drafted this motion in the aftermath of this 2003 decision. It's a motion for partial summary judgment, which means you can execute the 2003 decision in the pending Sandigan Bayan cases involving other assets of the Marcos family. That's how we got Arelma, uh, mm. a 40 million account in, the, in New York, uh, that the Marcos has claimed. That's how we got the jewelry that was still uh, held in escrow at the central bank. That's how we got paintings executed uh, even after I left the PCGG. That's how, it, in fact, the government of the Philippines, if it wanted to right now, can get other assets of the Marcos family that they can identify based on this 2003 decision. So theoretically speaking, if the PCGG finds another asset and were to say that we can go after them na kasi meron ng 2003 ruling, what would be the legal route? Do they go to Sandigan Bayan again for, uh, for you know, um, an enforcement of, of paano magko-collect? Exactly. It's exactly how you said it would be. It, the, the, this should not be complicated anymore. Uh, the 2003 decision not only simplified you know, the process to go after ill-gotten assets, it made it final. So there is now no way for the Marcos family to stand around, claim you know, there are still pending cases that have not ruled on the ill-gotten nature of our assets. That's not correct. So if, if, if I were in the commission right now, if I were still in the PCGG, I would check how many of these motions for summary judgment, partial summary judgment, are still pending. I'll ask the Sandigan Bayan to rule on that, and I'll go up. Now, that's, that's from a lawyer's perspective, litigating these cases. But because this is the Marcos family, because this is a family whose tentacles still reach into the present, even if their dictatorship was toppled decades ago, these tentacles obviously still can hold, control, even direct uh, people who are in a position to make decisions over what to do, how to go after Marcos' assets. So there's a political side to this that's important for lawyers to remember. Yeah. And if you're a lawyer, and if you want to be an activist lawyer, and if you want to be a lawyer going after the Marcos family, your strategy has to factor in these political considerations. Now, that was a factor when we litigated the 2003 case. It should still be a factor now. And so there are ways to go after the Marcos family now, enforce the 2003 judgment. But again, take note of the political factors that have to be reckoned with. All right. My next question would be about the Swiss foundations, but you did mention earlier that you wanted to clarify the usage of the name foundation. Can you discuss ano ba yung nature ng mga foundation sa Switzerland? Now, I don't know who exactly first used the word foundation to refer to the entities. And I use the word entity in, a, in the most generic way to the entities that were set up by the Swiss bankers of the Marcos family as early as 1968. But these are not foundations that are charitable, that help people. You know, the only beneficiaries of these so-called foundations are the Marcos children. And they, they are not children anymore. They were not children for a long time when they were um, getting money from the Swiss entities. And as a matter of fact, you know, yung, yung, yung kinakain, hindi lang ni Bongbong Marcos, 
hindi lang ni Amy Marcos o ni Irene Marcos, yung kinakain ng mga anak nila, yung kinakain ng mga apo nila, yung binabayad nila sa eskwelahan sa London, yung binabayad nila sa pagkain nila sa fine dining restaurant sa Tagaytay because I saw him post something about that recently, lahat yan, ill-gotten wealth. Isipin mo yan, yung pinapakain sa pamilyang Marcos galing sa nakaw na yaman. And so, hindi ito foundation na charitable. This is a foundation meant to hide, this is an entity meant to hide ill-gotten wealth. So, there are many of these that were established by Swiss bankers for the Marcoses, and some of them still exist, and some of them still hide their ill-gotten wealth. All right. The 2003 Supreme Court ruling lists some of these um, Swiss entities. At nakita ko dun sa listahan, they are the same entities that were listed by the 2018 conviction ni Imelda Marcos. So, same ba to, um Related ba yung graft conviction ni Imelda dun sa diniklara ng Supreme Court na ill-gotten na mga deposit dito sa mga Swiss entities na to? Right. So, uh, you're, you're correct in putting together these two sets of cases. Uh, the civil case that was decided in 2003. Civil because no person was punished. No, Imelda Marcos was not found guilty or innocent because the case was about an asset, not about the corrupt person. But take note that the forfeiture law on which the 2003 decision is based has also been characterized in, in the Philippines as a as a penal law, as a law that punishes because taking away someone's property or at least someone's claimed property that is ill-gotten is a form of punishment. So there's that case and the set of cases that affirmed it afterward. And then you have the criminal cases, uh, including the case for which she was convicted in 2018 on seven counts of graft for violating the constitutional prohibition that's also criminalized in Philippine law uh, prohibiting Philippine government officials from having a business interest, including business interests abroad. Because these were businesses established in Switzerland. What's interesting is that this wasn't the only criminal case filed against her. There were 32 other criminal cases filed by the Department of Justice, not by the PCGG, not by the, uh, Sandig not, not by the prosecutor before the Sandigan bias. 32 so-called dollar salting cases, cases involving a crime of opening bank accounts abroad using foreign currency without the permission of the Philippine government. Why was this a crime? Because Ferdinand Marcos issued a decree making it a crime. So she was charged of those crimes, uh, 32 counts of them, involving the same foundations uh, that are the, base, the same entities that are the basis for this 2018 conviction. The reason the 32 cases eventually got dismissed was, and, and I'll be brutally frank about this, corruption in the regional trial court that handled these cases. Um, it, it was so patently corrupt that, you know, you, 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 you imagine that if one judge in a trial court was this corrupt, can you imagine how far up corruption would be when the stakes are much higher than just $32 salting cases? So, um, when we were setting up the criminal case that eventually led to the conviction in 2018, it was important for us to prioritize the civil case because the civil case would lead to the return of assets. The criminal case could, of course, lead to punishment and conviction. And I know that many Filipinos want to see Imelda Marcos in jail, and that's important. But she could die the way Ferdinand Marcos is dead. And a person who's dead cannot be convicted. But assets they don't die. They just get transferred. They get transferred to children, they get transferred to grandchildren, and then they disappear and are hidden again. So it's important to go after the assets first, but lay the basis for the criminal case, which is what happened and which is why you have the 2018 conviction of Imelda Marcos. Just a follow up to the dollar salting. I do remember one dollar salting case that was dismissed by a Manila art by a Manila court na, na affirm yung dismissal sa Supreme Court. And I remember reading that decision. Um at parang pina ang pinapagalitan yung PCGG kasi hindi um diligent in safekeeping the documents. And this I read um repeatedly in all in other Sandigan Bayan decisions na photocopy. So um sumasablay sa best evidence rule. What can you say about that? 
no, first of all, let's separate these dollar salting cases from these pronouncements about submitting photocopies as evidence. The dollar salting case uh, was clear. Imelda Marcos never, in fact, denied that there were accounts in her name opened in Switzerland. That's dollar salting. Uh, what the judge in the trial court essentially said was, why would you only present the Swiss bank documents that are not notarized in Switzerland as if the Swiss bank documents, which are original, by the way, uh, as if you had to bring them to the city hall in Manila, you know, in front of this lawyer sitting there by his lonesome behind the desk and have them notarized. These are documents that were submitted officially to the official government institution in the Philippines that was supposed to receive them, the PCGG. So this is a judge that pretended to be ignorant of that process. So this is a judge who was already paid for by the Marcos family. And this was, in fact, a judge who, as an example of how corrupt the process was, Imelda Marcos wanted to travel, but even before she filed a motion to be allowed to travel, the judge already knew where she was going and approved it. That's how corrupt it was. Frank Chavez, in fact, the late Frank Chavez, a former solicitor general, in fact, questioned the judge's decision, uh, yeah. filed a administrative complaint against the judge, and it never went anywhere. So th these, are, these are the travails of going after a family that was in power for more than 20 years, whose tentacles still reach into the judiciary, whose money is still available to bribe uh, people who make decisions like, such as this. Now, that is different from the so-called submission of photocopies as evidence. I don't want to go long into this discussion, yeah. but really, um, if you were a prosecutor or especially a judge, even a justice in the Philippine Supreme Court, and you're sitting there now, or you're sitting there in the last, let's say, 20 years, if you didn't know what happened from 1968 to 1986, if you pretended to be blind to the corruption that took place, to the fact of dictatorship, not just the fact, but to the legal existence of a dictatorship because he decreed, he amended the constitution, he ruled by himself, uh, then that means you shouldn't be a prosecutor, you shouldn't be a judge. There is a very simple tool for lawyers to use when they're confronted by history. And it's something that I think first year law students already know by the end of the, of the freshman year in law school. And that's judicial notice. Lawyers, judges can take judicial notice, can acknowledge the existence of a fact. And is history a fact? It is. You, you can dispute the legal character of assets, for example, and the Marcoses have done that. But do you dispute the fact that there was a dictatorship? That is precisely the foundation of the PCGG. Executive Order Number 1, a law, a law that still exists up to now, issued by Corazon Aquino, February 28, 1986, actually declares the Marcoses as corrupt and the cronies as equally corrupt. And that's a legislative finding of fact. And again, coupled with judicial notice, and you have a legislative finding of fact in E01, you have the basis to say these things happen. So that when the PCGG, in possession of documents taken from Malacanang, brought to the central bank for safekeeping, some of them transferred to the PCGJ library because of trials before the Sandigan Bayan, and the PCGG, as the official government entity in charge of going after ill-gotten wealth, created by law, by E01, PCGG stamps that these are documents that were recovered from Malacanang or that were turned over by Swiss authorities. That's not a mere photocopy. That's not a violation of the best evidence rule. That's a product of the government's effort to go after the Marcos family and coupled with judicial notice, coupled with 
the legislative finding of fact that the Marcoses are corrupt, that should have been enough for the Supreme Court to say the burden of proof is now on the Marcoses to show why they have assets in excess of $304,000. All right. Um, when we talk about the Marcos corruption, we sometimes we describe it as the Marcosian plunder. Pero wala namang plunder case pending against them. Is it because uh, enacted lang in 1991 yung plunder and uh, it's not a retroactive law? Uh, yes, because that was precisely why former PCGG chairperson and then Senator and Senate President Tovito Salonga sponsored the law criminalizing plunder. Um, you can't prosecute Imelda Marcos for plunder now, but you can certainly prosecute her for corruption. And uh, in the hands of a smart and historically conscious justice of the Sandigan Bayan, you can get her convicted. Yung conviction, uh, the, the conviction of the mother for seven counts of graft, um, named as beneficiaries of at least two entities, sorry, of at least two Swiss entities were the Marcos children. So, pwede ba if some creative or brilliant lawyer out there, meron bang way para i-prosecute criminally the Marcos children just for being the beneficiaries of, a, of an entity that has been judged as illegally created and maintained? You don't even have to be 100% creative. Uh, I think you just have to be persistent uh, and file charges for money laundering against the Marcos children. That's why you have the anti-money anti laundering law laws in the Philippines. That's why you have this anti-money laundering council that apparently only goes after bank tellers or gamblers, but not uh plunderers like the marcos family but yeah you could you could go after them use the money laundering law the predicate offense is corruption they don't have to have been the ones who committed the specific acts of corruption except that they were already if i'm not mistaken of legal age when these uh swiss entities existed so they were participants in that corruption uh in the existence of these swiss entities but money laundering is a continuing offense and they continue to uh commit this offense Right. Um, let's talk about yung mga compromise agreements because when you read the 2003 ruling, it talks about a compromise agreement at dun nga na quote si Bongbong Marcos as having said, uh, I would like to, I am open to ending the problems of, of my family and uh, the Supreme Court took that to me as a judicial admission. Um, so can you tell us more about the compromise uh, agreements? Was it, is this really, can this really be called as an admission of corruption for the, uh, by the family? Well, his admission is an admission, whatever happened to that compromise agreement that was the context of that admission. The compromise agreement itself was struck down by the Supreme Court, Chavez versus Sandigan Bayan, if I'm not mistaken, one of the Chavez cases. And, and, and you know, to be to fair to Frank Chavez, uh, he persisted. And so the compromise agreement that was referred to here uh, was, was struck down uh, and uh, admission of Marcos Jr. Uh, remained. So he was asked about the bank account and he said, we're open to compromising on the bank account. And yet in the same context, in the same case, he, his mother, his siblings continued to deny that they own these bank accounts, which is what, which is what prompted uh, Chief Justice Corona, who wrote the decision to ask, why would you then oppose the recovery of these ill-gotten assets in Switzerland if you say you don't own it. Tama. Um, speaking of compromise agreements, yung basis din ng recent um, PCGG wins sa Sandigan Bayan, yung Royal Traders Holding Incorporated, was also based on a compromise agreement with Imelga Marcos nung pagdating nila sa Hawaii. So I'm just curious if, were there have there been any awards na walang compromise agreement as a context? Well, let, let me step back here uh, with your question. Uh, uh, yung, word, yung phrase kasi the compromise agreement in relation especially to Marcos cases has acquired a, a negative connotation. And I understand that connotation because there, have, there were compromise agreements that were patently wrong to enter into, which is what, one reason why one of them was struck down. And the, the, the agreement that was that led to this recent decision of the Sandigan Bayan was in fact not a compromise agreement. It was Imelda Marcos, 
simply saying, I'm giving up these assets uh, to the Philippines government. Uh, and I suspect the reason she gave up those assets was because she would have effectively violated U.S. law on bringing in um, cash and other assets into the United States without declaring them. Take note of the amounts that she was bringing in already, cash, uh, jewelry, on top of uh, these bank deposit certificates that she uh, gave up. So the, Hawa the, the court in the United States that um, awarded the, these assets to the Philippine government was simply declaring that Imelda Marcos signed off on it, and so it was turned over to the Philippine government. It wasn't a compromise agreement. Just to ano, um, discuss more dito sa bagong award no, yung Royal Trading Holdings Bank Certificate. So it appears that they sold to the Bank of Commerce, pero dun sa um, sale contract, sinabi ng Bank of Commerce that they will not assume liability for the um, for the um, civil case. Uh, and then Bank of Commerce has come out with a statement saying, this ascending self saying that they're a different entity. And when you Google Royal Trading Holdings Bank, medyo hindi mo alam if it still exists. So my question is, and I, the question of many is, paano nakukunin yung recent award na yun? How do they even begin to find that money? Sagutin ko yung last question later, no? yung paano mo hahabulin ngayon yan. Uh, but first, you know, uh, this is a rhetorical question because I'm going to Google it later. Who owns Bank of Commerce? Uh, is there any relationship between the owners of Bank of Commerce, the majority owners, and the Marcus family? So I think your listeners can, can you know, Google is your friend for that. Um, but really, regardless of who owns Bank of Commerce, regardless of how what you discover when you Google Bank of Commerce and who owns it, I don't know what kind of bank it is that does not do its due diligence when acquiring assets, especially another bank, Traders Royal Bank. And, and the Traders Royal Bank is called Traders Royal Bank because it started out as a bank for sugar traders owned by Marcos Crony Roberto Benedicto, controlled mm -hmm. sugar industry in the Philippines. He was a, you know, he called himself a sugar trader, but really he was a corrupt Marcos Crony who earned on the, who, who profited legally from the back of thousands and hundreds of thousands of poor, malnourished sugarcane workers in the Philippines. That's Traders Bank. It was, there was an investment by, by the Royal Canadian Bank, which I suspect Benedicto himself had shares in, in Traders Royal Bank. That's why they took the name Royal as well. And part of this case, in fact, is about those investments by the Canadian hmm. bank in, in Traders. Now, let's set that aside. Um, the fact is that this Bank of Commerce did not, do, did, did not do due diligence in finding out exactly what kind of liabilities it was excluding or including. So when they claim in this case in the Sandigan Bayan that we specifically excluded uh, certificates of deposit that were denominated in pesos, and when they claim in the Sandigan Bayan that they specifically excluded claims by the Philippine government involving the Marcoses before they acquired Traders Royal Bank, the fact is they did not do, do their due diligence because they would have found out that even if they did that, even if they put it there in their agreement, the government is not a stop. The government, the people of the Philippines, the Republic of the Philippines, the state, is not party to their agreement. It's Bank of Commerce and look at the owner and Traders Royal Bank, and look at the owner, it's an agreement between these two, and I should say this, these two Marcos Link entities that has nothing to do with the government of the Philippines. You can say, no, I won't pay for that, or no, that's not part of this purchase. Pa para kang bumili ng, ng lupa, yung sabi may ari ng lupa, binibenta niya dun sa bibili, pero may nakatira dun, na siguro lumabas lang, or hindi niya alam na Meron palang nag-occupy ng lupa niya. Kasama ba ako dyan sa bentahan nila? Hindi. Uh, am I bound by that? No. Uh, especially because there's a specific rule. The state cannot be subject of estoppel. No? And, and it's, estoppel is a peculiar legal concept, but it just means 
the government is not bound by anything that two other people want to say or do, especially if there's a hint, which is what I think, of avoiding liability to the government, of trying to bring out ill-gotten wealth from this discussion. But Carranza, that being said, how does the government start to press the Bank of Commerce even for just information? Kung may categorical dismissal yung sandigan ba yun? Kasi meron silang ano doon na well, weird dismissal. Not a, yeah, this is not a criminal case. So this is, this is not an acquittal of a bank. You know? hmm. only, the French, only the French criminalize corporate crimes. So corporations are punished there. And if we adopted that, you would have all these entities actually dissolved and shut down as punishment. But the, the Philippine government can appeal this decision, specifically argue that Bank of Commerce is liable because it absorbed all the assets of Traders Royal Bank. You know, whatever they say about that there's still a Traders Royal Bank, sure, go after them too. But go after, you know, these, these certificates of deposit are refer to money money is as lawyers would say fungible you don't you don't specify in the certificates of deposit that only these pesos denominated with the serial numbers are ill-gotten well right you, any money that was transferred to bank of commerce should be subject to um, the recovery of ill-gotten wealth and and and, and the second very specific point lian the agreement between Bank of Commerce and Traders Royal Bank refers only to peso denominated certificates of deposit. There's a $5 million certificate of deposit in what Imelda Marcos surrendered to the PCGG uh, before the U.S. court. So that, there's no reference to that. Now, you wonder why the decision doesn't mention that. And I and I sense, and, and with all due respect to whoever, the legal researcher, the justice assigned off on this, and two, two, two others assigned off, um, you know, it, it, this was a case that they could have decided with more nuance the way cases involving $5 million should be decided. And you don't just throw away $5 million like that without referring to the fact that the same agreement that they rely on and say, you know, Bank of Commerce, no longer part of this case, doesn't actually exclude that $5 million certificate of deposit. Right. Um, and you talk, You mentioned kanina the propaganda of the Marcoses. When you talk about the Marcosian corruption, their loyalists would always say, eh, may nakulong ba, may napa rosahan ba? And that's their baseline defense, no? So my question is, could the Marcoses have been impleded in some other way, even dito sa Royal Traders Bank? Kasi dun sa citation of the facts ng Sandigan Bayan, malinaw naman na sinasabi nilang dinala to ng mga Marcoses sa Hawaii. So could there, could there have been another way to at least implead them criminally or whatever? They were. And, and, and that's why you had the dollar salting cases. That's why you had uh, the Swiss entity cases. Um, if you look at this decision again, there's a circular way that was done to hide the Marcos interest in Traders Royal Bank. They used Banque Paribas, the French bank, mm -hmm. to try to hide the investments of uh, Royal Canadian Bank in Traders Royal Bank. And separate from this, separate from this, there were in fact cases involving the the same modus operandi of of um, transferring money to Switzerland and the Swiss banks buying certificates of deposit in mm -hmm. Philippine banks. So it's money laundering through Switzerland that was done uh, by the Marcoses involving traders' royal banks. So criminal cases were in fact filed. And, and that's been part of the problem, that when you have a strategy that separates criminal cases from civil cases and operate separately, controlled by prosecutors who at the very least, don't talk to each other or at most are, are reached by the tentacles of the Marcos family, then you do have a problem enforcing accountability, uh, holding the Marcoses to account. Now, all that, all that said, the, the, the fact is that if not for, and I'll say this again, corruption in the Philippine judiciary, um, Imelda Marcos would have been convicted. Uh, 
Imelda Marcos was convicted in 1993 for a very basic crime. Again, the same type of crime that she was convicted for in 2018, involving this time assets of the light rail terminals, uh, which her so-called Philippine Foundation lease, but which in fact went to her friends. Uh, they were under price. And the Sandigan Bayan, under then presiding Justice Francis Garcitorena, convicted her for that crime. Uh, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The, con the Supreme Court of the Philippines, in fact, affirmed her conviction. One division, Clarida Ruth Romero, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe Irene Cortez, but uh, the, the Supreme Court justices convicted her. Uh, they filed a motion for reconsideration, the Marcoses. It was sus the, the, the conviction was sustained. That should have been the end of it. Instead, they went to the entire Supreme Court and appealed to the Supreme Court and back, which in the Philippine Constitution, as I think lawyers in the Philippines would know, would only be possible if you're raising a doctrinal question. Is the guilt of Imelda Marcos a doctrinal question? It's not. So why was it possible for the Supreme Court to be forced to take another look at the conviction of Imelda Marcos in 1993? Estelito Mendoza. <laughs> I knew you were going to go to Estelito Mendoza and he did it again years later for ano, Philippine Airlines. But that's uh, for another discussion. May mga nakikita uh, no, rin no, no, tayo. No, but, but listen, but, but listen. And, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong here, right? But many of the solicitors, solicitor generals, you know, who work for Estelito Mendoza are now in, in, in high positions in the Philippine judiciary. Some of them work with him, including all the way up to the Supreme Court. So it's important for, for Filipinos to, to look at the context of this. That's why I said the political context has to be considered as well when, when assessing or even criticizing the PCGG or prosecutors for, for this or that decision uh, involving the Marcos uh, family. Right. Um, as I was saying kanina, uh, merong tayong mga nakikitang kaso that is against um, a crony. To put the question bluntly, kapag merong um, isang decision uh, rendered in favor of the government tapos ang sisingilin yung crony, tingin mo ba Marcos din ang ultimately the source of what the payment would be? Uh, well, there's for a first way to respond to that question. Um, in practically 90% of the civil cases that were filed by the PCGG, and many of them were filed before I joined the commission. So when I went there, I was just looking at specific cases already pending. Um, the Marcoses were always impleted in those cases. So you, because you would have to allege that this took place, like I said, in a historical context. There was a dictatorship. You were a crony of the dictator. Um, should the Marcoses be ultimately also responsible for judgments against Marcos cronies? Yes. Uh, in, in very simple terms, the, judge, the, the, the liability is joint and solidarity. This is a civil case. So any of the parties who are liable, uh, you can go after any, some, or all of them. You can go after the Marcos estate, meaning the children controlling the estate, or the Marcos crony. All right. Uh, moving to another topic. Correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Caranza. Yung mga ill-gotten wealth na recover natin, that's a different set of money. For example, if victims file a claim for damages, like yung in-award sa Hawaii kina Eta Rosales, pero dinismiss ng CA noong 2017. Uh, for example, yung $71 billion sa tax ng... Um, from their taxes to buy San Miguel shares. Yung mga coconut uh, farmers and planters ba, did they fa file claim for damages also for being, you know, robbed of their taxes? Uh, yes, and it's not just, first of all, it's, it shouldn't just have been enforcement of a foreign judgment that the victims of human rights violations during the dictatorship should have filed in the Philippines. Um, that's a, this is a topic for another discussion, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a reason why you could have filed and you perhaps should have filed a damages case in the Philippines against the Marcoses rather than use the foreign judgment here. Uh, but it's possible and it is still arguably possible to do that for as long as the Marcos children continue to hide, and like I said, um, 
potentially are committing money laundering offenses. The coconut farmers involving the collection of the coconut levy, filing a claim for damages against those who benefited from the coconut levy. Yes, again, against the estate of those who benefited from the coconut levy, or even against, for example, a, a retired senator who continues to spew his apologies, his, his, you know, his excuses for, for the Marcos dictatorship uh, even now. So you, you can do this. Um, so, meron na bang existing case where the government naman on its behalf has filed for a claim of damages for being robbed as a government? Uh, and yes, because every complaint, every civil complaint, um, at least for recovery of assets, includes the damage that uh, was incurred by the government. So, as an example, the recently decided and affirmed by the Supreme Court judgment against uh, the estate of Herminio Dicini for corruption involving the Bataan nuclear power plant includes damages that can be collected and that can be collected from the estate of Dicini and and from the estate of the Marcoses, including damages for the corruption that they th those two dead people committed. All right, I'm down to my last two questions. Yung um, 174 billion pesos na na-recover na ng PCGG, it has been earmarked for uh, agrarian reform, coco levy, and then I think my 10 billion pesos earmarked for human rights uh, victims. Uh, American lawyer Robert Swift believes that lahat dapat ng makukuhang ill-gotten wealth o mare-recover dapat lahat para sa human rights victims. What's your take on that? Uh, well... I guess this is a longer discussion, but the, the problem with the theory that Robert Swift adopted in going after the Marcoses for human rights violations is that it denies their corruption. You will not see in the cases he filed in the United States, even now, while they're pending involving the realm assets, for example, you will not see a, an explicit statement that says, the Marcos has committed corruption. You will not see that because in his theory of his case, if he says that, then the Marcoses don't own the assets he's trying to go after. So, you know, it, it's one thing to try to evoke sympathy for victims of the Marcos dictatorship because they deserve not just sympathy, they deserve justice. But it's another to hide the corruption of the Marcos family so that you can go after their assets in the United States. But... That problem was actually fixed, and, and I, I'm, I'm happy to say, and I'm very proud to say, I was part of the, of the effort to fix that. How? By drafting and eventually getting a law passed, providing reparations to the victims of the Marcos dictatorship. That's in the law. There's a $10 million separate fund for memorializing the victims of the dictatorship, and you know, it solves the problem. We, you are talking about the 2013 law that created the Human Rights Claims Board and continues to um, um, issue claims to 11,000 exactly. successful claimants. Right. And, and, you know, there were more beneficiaries uh, under that law than, than in Bob Swift's effort. In fact, when, when he last distributed payments, because he was able to collect uh, in the United States against some of the assets surrendered by a few Marcus cronies, there were people who showed up, uh, as I understand, in UP Diliman to get what they thought they would get, only to be turned away. Uh, some of these people were, in fact, beneficiaries in the reparations law uh, passed by the Philippine government under um, Aquino. Right. Um, my last question, the last 15 minutes of this conversation only proves one thing. No? Yung corruption and our long road to recovery is very, very institutionalized. So why do people still choose to forget and why can they get away with forgetting what has happened? You, you only forget something if you knew about it in the first place. And for many people, there's a lack of knowledge. And the Marcoses have, of course, fed that and turned it into deliberate ignorance, willful ignorance in some cases, because even people who knew and could have known will now choose to be willfully ignorant. And, and the reason 
this has happened is in part because the focus of efforts to hold the Marcoses accountable was in, in many ways not as strategic as it should have been, not as comprehensive as it should have been. And, and in my work, in my work doing transitional justice, post-conflict, post-dictatorship in other countries, that's one of the lessons, that you cannot just deal with corruption. You have to deal with human rights violations as well. Nor can you only deal with human rights violations. You have to deal with corruption as well, committed by dictators, committed by war criminals. Because corruption and human rights violations are mutually reinforcing. It's very difficult to go after the corrupt when they're able to torture you, when they're able to extrajudicially kill you or disappear you. And it's very difficult to go after extrajudicial killers if they can commit corruption with impunity and use the money to sustain their impunity as well. So both have to be addressed. And that's one of the failures of the transitional justice effort in the Philippines. It's not irreparable. It's not something that cannot be addressed now. That was why that 2013 reparations law was passed. And it's still possible to even create a truth commission involving the Marcos dictatorship to help people remember. Right. Thank you so much, um, Attorney Carranza. Uh, you can listen. Thank you so much for the insights. You can listen to the entire audio of this recording on Spotify and all platforms that you get your podcast. Thank you so much. That was former PCGG Commissioner Ruben Carranza. I am Lian Buan. Have a good evening.